are going to move on into chapter 5 of James. Uh, And as we do so, what we will encounter is an immediate change, as it were, in the mood. As James becomes almost incandescent, I think, with prophetic rage as he lambasts the idle rich who he feels has been exploiting the poor amongst his own distant, far-flung flock. And what I want to do is to read to you these opening six verses. We'll have them up on the wall here as well. But listen to the change in mood. Listen to the force uh, that James pours into this passage. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered innocent men who are not opposing you. Now these are pretty powerful words from the lips of James and you can really, I think, sense his anger of the way in which these rich people were exploiting the poor in this Christian community. People who, if my conjecture has been right, have already suffered suffered considerable loss as the result of the persecution through which they had already passed. Persecution that had resulted in their being driven from their homes, in their losing basically their goods and their livelihoods. Now here they are, far from home, poor and vulnerable. And of course at that state they need work in order that they might earn enough to give their families food. But because they're poor, they're vulnerable. And because they're vulnerable, they're open to exploitation. And that's precisely, I think, now what is happening to them here. They are being exploited by unscrupulous landowners. And it makes James's blood boil. Now, in making this attack, James is using a figure of speech that is known as apostrophe which is something that is spoken to those who aren't present for the benefit of those who are. And so though he's addressing these words to the rich, to the powerful, to those who are abusing the poor, the main purpose of this is for those who are actually listening, those who are poor and who are being given the opportunity to be encouraged by what James has to say. James wants his his immediate audience to understand that their cries have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty, and he will repay the oppressor. Their day is coming. Judgment is on the road. The oppressor will be judged by God. Now, this is not the first time that James has had the rich in his sights. Um, You may recall how back in chapter 2, he had had to challenge the church's rather unhelpful or unhealthy partiality towards the rich which had been evidenced at some of their meetings. You may recall how that back in chapter 2, James had sought to correct what he saw as being this error on their part. So let's go back to chapter 2, and he he tells this story here. He says, let's imagine for a moment, shall we? You have this man who comes into your meeting, and he's wearing a gold ring and fine clothes. And then you also have this poor man who comes in and and he's just wearing shabby clothes. Now, neither of them are believers. What are you going to do? Rich man comes in, poor man comes in. What, What are you going to do? Are you, says James, going to show special attention to the man who is wearing the fine clothes? And are you going to say to him, here's a good seat for you? And then you're going to say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Because he says, if that's what you're going to do, then you have become guilty of discrimination. You have become judges with evil thoughts. 
that you will look down upon people and separate one from the other just on their outward appearance. And that, says James, is not acceptable. It is not how we as believers should behave. That is not to be our approach. As James says at the beginning of chapter 2 and verse 1, my brothers, as believers in our Lord, glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Don't separate between people just on their looks and appearances. As believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are not to discriminate. Rather, we are to treat everyone on exactly the same footing. Their economic status is to be irrelevant to us. So, if a rich man comes in, squeeze up a little bit so that he can sit down next to you and resist the temptation to work out what 10% of his income could do for the church. Just welcome him. Because, says James, he needs a saviour. And when a poor man comes in, welcome him too, despite the fact that he is sartorially and aromatically challenged, and resist the temptation to calculate how much of a drain this man's going to be upon the fellowship. Just sitting beside the rich man. Because actually, they're both human beings, created in the image of God, in need of a saviour. That's what actually matters. That's what you should be seeing. Not whether they're wealthy or poor, but what their need is before God. And so to that end, you welcome them, because you have something for them that the world doesn't. And that's the saviour. And then when the service is over, you can flock around them. If the rich man comes back the next week, rejoice. If the poor man comes back, rejoice. If they both come back, praise God and pray for their salvation. And look forward to the day when they shall both be best of friends in Christ. Because that's what the gospel can do. Trouble was, James's congregation was being too easily swayed by the prospect of ka -ching. They liked its sound. Perhaps they were thinking that, well, look, if you had somebody in your congregation who was well-known in the local community, someone who had influence and, well, money as well as it happens, then surely that could only be good for the church. It would raise our, you know, level in society, in the community. It's good, isn't it? No, says James. Not exactly. Well, why not? Well, says James, if you recall... It was these self-same people, these rich people, who you are now trying to welcome, who only the other day were actually exploiting you. And not only that, they were dragging you off into court, says James, and trying to squeeze the last penny out of you. And then if that wasn't bad enough, says James, they were also slandering the noble name of your saviour. And now you want to snuggle up to them? And you're saying, that's okay? He says, what are you thinking? How can you be so easily beguiled by the presence of wealth? Well, the answer to that is quite simple. Wealth is beguiling. That's the problem. Wealth is beguiling. Now, perhaps I ought to say at this point that the Bible doesn't condemn wealth, I think, in and of itself. What it is interested in, however, is how wealth is acquired and how that wealth is then used. And it's interested in the impact that wealth can have upon its owner. That's what concerns the writers of the Bible. And it's quite clear from Scripture that actually wealth can be a very tricky thing. And if you are not careful, it can exert a deadly influence upon your life. And because of that, you need to be wary of wealth because there's something about money that can too easily beguile you. Now, if you look, say, at the Apostle Paul and his teaching on it, um, he reminds us in 2 Timothy, oh, sorry, 1 Timothy 6, verse 6 to 10. He reminds us there that godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Be thankful, he says, that you have sufficient. People who want to get rich, he goes on to say, fall into temptations and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Be careful, says Paul, because wealth, riches, money have this capacity to corrupt. And we are very vulnerable 
to the beguiling appeal of money. Beware, says James. Beware, says Jesus. Beware, says Paul. All the writers throughout the New Testament and all are saying, beware. Watch out for the dangers of wealth. And it is the corrupting effect of money, the corrupting effect of wealth, that James focuses on here in this passage in chapter 5. And the first thing we see is the way in which its corrupt, corrupting influence had beguiled the believers in the congregation. Because what had happened is they turned a blind eye to the immoral practices of these rich individuals. As we read in chapter 2, these rich individuals had actually persecuted a number in the church. But now these believers were suddenly saying, oh, that's all right, if you've got money, then you're welcome. And James has to remind them, beware the beguiling effect of wealth. It blinds you to certain things. He says you need to wake up to who these people are and what they have done to you. But then secondly, James highlights here, the corrupting effect of wealth upon the rich themselves. These rich people were using their wealth to exploit others. It brought them power, and they abused their power. They abused the poor. They withheld the wages. They engaged, no doubt, in bribery when it came to court cases. They always held the trump card. And then, as James says, to crown it all, they were dismissive of God himself. Because, well, no doubt they felt, why do they need God? They had everything they wanted. If you're rich, you don't need God. You don't need him to help you out. You can help yourself. James highlights the corrupting effect of wealth, what it does to the way we think, to who corrupts the people we actually are. And it is this beguiling and corrupting effect of wealth that is also picked up. um, Bells ring right across the scriptures, but Asaph in Psalm 73. um, I didn't read it earlier, but you may recall from that psalm that Asaph, Asaph talks about the prosperity of the wicked and how appealing and beguiling it seems. And in Psalm 73, he actually acknowledges the violence of the rich. He acknowledges their arrogance, their cavalier disregard of God. But the thing that concerns Asaph most is that he found himself wanting a slice of the action. He says in Psalm 70, verse three, 73, verse 3, I envied the arrogant when I saw their prosperity. Oh, if I was any like them, that, that would be good. I'm not asking too much. I don't need to be as rich as them, but if I... I had the money like they had the money. What a difference it would make. And he was envious of them until, that is, God showed him the final end of the rich, of those who he had envied. He says how that on a particular occasion he entered the sanctuary of God and God must have given him some sort of vision and he says, then I understood their final destiny and then I envied them no more. I saw what would happen to these people. I saw what God was going to do. Judgment was coming upon these rich people for their oppression of the poor, for their arrogance before God. And James is saying, well, really, what befell? These rich in Psalm 73 is what's going to befall these rich here in James. Utter misery lies before them. Terrible distress and wretchedness is the prospect that stretches out before them. James calls upon them. You rich people, he says here in James chapter 5, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming your way. Weep, it's an imperative, it's a command, and, and wail, literally it's burst into weeping and howl with grief. The howl there is this shriek of terror at what is coming. And that is just from the very, just, just the anticipation of the misery that is coming. That's not caused by the actual misery, that's caused by the anticipation of the misery that's coming. See, he says, what is coming to you. See what you are going to reap from what you have sown. Burst into weeping, 
howl with grief, shriek with terror at the misery that is coming upon you. And James then goes on in these opening verses here to picture their hoarded wealth heaped high, accumulated, as it were, at the expense of others. And he sees it all piled up, unused. And now he says it's rotting away through lack of use, the clothing ravaged by moths, the gold and silver, as it were, going rusty. Uh, back, oh yes, that is it. Going rusty. Your wealth has rotted. The moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. The picture here is of wealth rotting away. They've got so much of it, they don't know what to do with it. And so you could say this is exhibit one in the case of the prosecution against the rich. Your wealth has rotted. Despite the fact that you had the means to clothe the naked and feed the hungry, you failed to do so. You just let your wealth rot there, doing nothing at all. The bottom line is that these people did nothing to ease the plight of the poor, but only exacerbated their situation. James goes on to say that this corroded heap of riches will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. Their guilt at what they had done will consume them. It's not actually even the punishment of God that consumes them. It's the guilt. It's been haunted for all eternity by what they had and never used. Eternally haunted by their crime. That will forever condemn them. Exhibit 1, in the case of the prosecution against the rich. And this, I think you may say, is a universal truth. Not just applied here in James or in Asaph in Psalm 73. Right through the ages, the principle of judgment against the rich who have abused, used their wealth abusively. Then in uh, verse 4, James highlights, goes on to highlight, further evidence against them. We can exhibit this, uh, label this exhibit 2. Look, he says, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. He says you have defrauded your workers. And of course that goes on all across the world today. Workers are defrauded by the rich who make their money on the backs of the poor. You have defrauded these workers. And of course for many labourers in the Middle East they lived a hand-to-mouth existence. You got paid a day at a time. What you got today, paid for tomorrow. If you didn't get today, you couldn't pay for tomorrow. And so these people were being defrauded of what they had rightfully earned. Non-payment of wages could have serious ramifications. The wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields, they are exhibit two in the prosecution's case against the rich. Not only um, had they hoarded the wages that testify against their ruthless, heartless approach, but also exhibit three, James highlights the cries of the harvesters. These two have reached the ears, says James, of the Lord Almighty. Literally, it's the Lord Sabaoth. He uses an unusual term, a term which in the Old Testament highlighted the forces that God had at his disposal. It was Jehovah Savar, was the Lord of hosts. And James uses this particular phrase, referring to the Lord of hosts. Um, it's a phrase that David used when he went out to attack Goliath. He said to Goliath, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin. I come against you in the name of God, oh, sorry, in the name of the Lord Almighty, the Lord Sabaoth. The God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. And says, James, it is the Lord of hosts who has heard the cry of the harvesters, and you don't mess with the Lord of hosts. You may be rich and powerful. You may be able to manipulate people and, and, and use people to your own ends. But you cannot manipulate God. He is the Lord of hosts, the Lord Almighty. However, the case for the prosecution is not yet over. Exhibit 4. You lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. Whilst you indulged yourselves, the poor have starved. And you've done nothing to help them. At which point this truth creeps a little bit nearer home. 
in other parts of the world, in many parts of the earth, there are the poor. We see them in our adverts on television. They're starving. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. Evidence brought by the case for the prosecution against the rich in their abuse of the poor. And then finally, Exhibit 5. You have condemned and murdered innocent men who, he goes on to say, were not opposing you. You show this total disregard. Perhaps you may find, you know, some poor person decides to make a stand. The next moment his body is found in a ditch. He's poor, who cares? Poor can be trampled all over by the rich. You have condemned and murdered innocent men. All of which, though, in the case of the prosecution, puts the rich on a collision course with God. Judgment is coming. And James is very clear about this. <laughs> you could say, where's the gospel message to the rich? Well, there is a gospel message to the rich, but there's also a warning, in fact, that needs to come before it. And saying, if you use your wealth to abuse, then this is what you expect. This is what is coming. I know at the moment you've got your Lamborghini and you can lie beside your pool and you've got a lovely house and you've got a lovely house in five different countries. But this is what is coming. Weep, wail, for this is on the way. You can't see it now and it doesn't look at all like it, but it is coming and, and James highlights that fact. Weep and wail. And it is that prospect of future judgment that James here highlights. And then he goes on to point out why. The, the pastoral application, in fact, comes in verse 7, which we're not getting to in any degree this week. But James says, in the light of the fact that God is going to address the injustices that his people here have suffered uh, means that it will finally be addressed. And because of that, God's people are not to despair or to take matters into their own hands. But they are, final one, to be patient until the Lord's coming. Leave it with God. God will sort it out. That, that's, that's how within the church one may respond. Different countries, different situations. But that's how the poor within the church of Christ may respond to those who are abusing them. God will finally deal with this. But leave it to him. Leave it to him. Don't take matters into your own hands. Be patient until the Lord's coming. Now what I'd like to do, God willing, is to return to this whenever the next Sunday morning turns up uh, and, and look at it from more of the Old Testament background that, that informed James' own thinking and how that's then influenced by the new covenant experience he has as well. But what I want to do this morning was just to run through this passage where we may read and think, well, what's that got to do with us? It's a bit harsh. Woo, James, you know, what did he eat this morning? What, what upset him? But no, this is how it is. This is what's coming. There's a judgment coming where God will write and repay things that have been done in this earth. And he's saying, weep and wail. Just the very prospect of the awfulness of what is coming should alert people to flee to Christ. Let's pray.